Thank you, Stephanie. And thank you, everyone, for joining this webinar today, discussing banks issuing COVID-19 emergency loans at scale. We decided to launch this series of webinars as we've been having many conversations with clients who are facing new and unusual challenges as they have to adapt their businesses to this pandemic world. We've been helping clients take physical processes that are now incredibly difficult, if not impossible, to conduct and virtualize them. My name is Anna Lester. I'm the Business Development Director at SNC Interlinks, and I will be your moderator today. We have a great lineup of speakers from both sides of the pond. Pete Keevil leads our North American sales team covering our banking clients. Adam Preedy leads our EMEA sales engineering team and works extensively with UK's biggest banks. Alan Serafi is a senior sales engineer in North America and has been instrumental in implementing small business lending solutions with our clients. And finally, last but not least, Dominic Brown, who leads our North American sales engineering team and works very closely with North America's largest banks. So a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. This session is going to be recorded uh, and we will be distributing that recording early next week. If you have any questions, uh, please ask them through the Q&A chat box. We will store those questions as we go through the session um, and answer them at the end. So let's get started. For those of you who are playing COVID webinar bingo, I thought I would get it in early. These are unprecedented times. The various lockdown measures in response to coronavirus have halted economic activity completely in some sectors and caused mass disruption in others. The resulting job losses and bankruptcies are likely to create major economic strains for millions around the world. We've seen different governments respond in different ways. So a lot have had immediate fiscal responses, for example, additional government spending on medical resources and measures to keep people on the payroll. Uh, they've also foregone revenues and certain taxes. And this is fantastic for quick stabilization, but of course leads to immediate deterioration of balanced budgets um, with really no direct compensation in the foreseeable future. There's also been deferrals. Uh, several governments have decided to defer certain payments, uh, which in principle should be paid back later. A few countries have even deferred the servicing of loans and the payment of utility bills. And also some other liquidity provisions and guarantees, uh, like guarantees on exports, liquidity assistance and credit lines through national development banks. And all of this while fighting a global pandemic and operating in lockdown. So today we're going to focus on some of the immediate fiscal responses that have been taken globally. Uh, Adam Preedy, uh, what kind of variances are we seeing internationally with these fiscal packages? Yeah, thanks, Anna. In short, we're seeing massive variances both uh, around the globe and, and in the Eurozone. For example, as a percentage of GDP, Italy has provided a stimulus of, a stimulus of only 0.9%, whereas in the US, that's 9.1%. Conversely, however, though, Italy is guaranteeing nearly 30% uh, of loans. Uh, however, in the US, that's only 26 the UK sits somewhere in between both, both of these numbers, but it, it's fair to say there's a, there's a huge variance. Fantastic. I think the, uh, we're seeing governments implement these measures to try and offer some relief to their, to their citizens and their, and their businesses, and there's probably more of those to come. So let's take a bit of a closer look. Um, Pete, can you talk us through the, the measures in the US? Yeah, thanks, Anna, and hello, everyone. So here in the U.S., the CARES Act was passed on March 27th, and its Paycheck Protection Program, the PPP, was launched just one short week later on April 3rd. Now, we heard stories that in the early hours, the launch date at around 2 a.m., lenders were still receiving guidance from the SBA. So to say these banks had to move quickly is, is frankly, a, a, a massive understatement. Plus, uh, the $349 billion that was allocated was done so on a first-come, first-served basis, which just added to the overall time crunch. Uh, that initial pot of funding was, was emptied in just a couple of weeks, with nearly 2 million loans issued. Uh, to put this into context, the SBA approved just 58,000 loans to the tune of $28 billion in all of 2019. 
So it took just two weeks to get through 10x what was funded in all of last year. Simply put, this has been a huge undertaking by everyone involved, and rightly so. These businesses are the engine of any economy. Um, and thankfully, as everyone will be aware, PPP round two with a further 310 billion in additional funding is now underway. Now, I understand, Adam, uh, that the UK has introduced a new scheme rolling in on May 4th. Is that right? That's right, Pete. Thanks. Yeah, the UK is launching the new bounce back loan scheme on Monday to complement other existing coronavirus business interruption schemes. This particular scheme is aimed at small businesses and offers uh, fully guaranteed loans by the government of between two and fifty thousand pounds. These loans will be interest free for the first year, and the aim is to roll out these vital cash injections really quickly through a fairly simple application process. Yes. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Adam. I mean, look to to, to use Anna's word of the day. This is simply an unprecedented global public-private mobilization effort involving government and lenders on the one hand, and the small business community on the other. Uh, it's unprecedented, unprecedented in terms of size, uh, with lenders fielding millions of applications. But uh, as we're all painfully aware. Uh, the pandemic has also made this unprecedented in terms of rollout and the challenges associated. Given the nature of the exercise, uh, the, the challenges of the banks are many. First off, these applications and supporting evidence contain PII, and there's really no way around it. Uh, these apps can't be largely redacted. Uh, they will contain sensitive employee data and could contain customer info as well. And if mishandled, obviously, the, the risk of leak is high. Um, borrowers obviously can't walk into their local branch and simply hand the information over. One of the clients I'm speaking with has traditionally run all these applications in hard copy, in person, with a handshake, uh, and naturally with lockdown implemented, they've had to move everything digital. Now, if it's possible to make matters worse, all the stakeholders, the loan agents, the business owners, everyone is working remote. Yeah, thanks, Pete. We're also seeing the risk of vital funds running out for these companies if the banks don't move quickly. Only a few weeks ago here in the UK, it was estimated only 4% of funds had been allocated, which is a major concern both for the government and small business owners alike. As these vital businesses get desperate for funds and applications increase, banks are just being overwhelmed by the scale of the inbound applications that they need to pr pr process and, and turn around. Like you said, we are also seeing banks dealing with 10 times the usual volumes of what they typically expect, given the scale of the challenge. This, ha this is happening at a time when thousands of bank staff are working from home, critical systems, businesses' usual systems may not be available. And so banks are really conscious that they just can't spin up a new IT system to deal with these types of funding applications at a scale that hadn't previously been anticipated. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And I guess with all these challenges and the inundation of work, shortcuts really sound tempting, um, but banks really can't afford to take shortcuts either. You know, they face litigation and potential regulatory fines should leaks occur, uh, but they're also anticipating a wave of fraudulent claims in the billions. So really a careful eye needs to be cast across the entire process. But on the flip side, you know, move too slowly and you miss out on the opportunity or worse, face reputational damage and, and lose clients. And I think, Adam, you're seeing that unfold in Europe. Is that right? That's right, Pete. Yeah. Uh, reputational concerns are weighing heavily on banks' minds as they struggle to respond to the, the volume and just the sheer scale of, of, of the challenges. Interestingly, the crisis is also affecting how customers perceive banks and is already driving uh, some changes in behaviours. Uh, Q1 saw the biggest number of switches we've seen here. And uh, Monzo, which is a, a digital bank, interestingly, took the number one spot in attracting those switchers in what was the, the third highest switching month on record. Yeah, it's interesting. We're kind of seeing a similar dynamic play out, play out here in the US, where, where fintechs like PinPal and NewTex received approval to lend under the PPP program kind of late in the game, but they ramped up the speed to lend immensely, and in doing so, racked up a huge amount of customer satisfaction points. So look, many of our clients have reached out to us to see how we can address these challenges and solve for the risks. Uh, now, my colleague Dom has been central to crafting our solution. So with that said, uh, we'll pass over to Dom to take us through how we can address these issues. So over to you, Dom. Dom, you may be on mute.
Am I still on mute? There you go. Okay, thank you. Uh, so thanks everyone. Thanks, Pete. Uh, good after afternoon. So the compelling event here in the United States has been the CARES Act, which Pete talked about a minute ago, where the United States government is has loaned $350 billion to small businesses impacted by COVID-19. So several of our banks and other lenders have approached Interlinks in helping them meet the demand for these loans. And these, these banks are compelled you know, by the Government Act, but they're also compelled, uh, they wanna help their customers that, uh, they wanna help their customers survive the economic downturn caused by COVID-19. Um, they also face a competitive threat in that any one of these banks or lenders that has been authorized by the United States government can process these loans. So Bank A can jump in and process the loans for the customers of Bank B. So there's a pretty big competitive threat as well, and there's tight deadlines. So uh, Interlinks um, has a small business banking solution that we've deployed at several banks. We have a solution in place. And when we built this solution, we know that these small businesses come from all walks of life. So we really, uh, simplicity and ability scale was really core to what we tried to achieve with this small business banking solution. So with simplicity in mind, we've taken a simple folder-based approach where each customer gets, or each small business rather, gets their own dedicated folder where they can upload their loan applications, their supporting loan documentation, and give those back to the bank. And as Pete mentioned, you know, it's simple, but it's really important, right? Because each one of these documents contains sensitive PII and needs to be treated with the utmost security that's requisite for handling this PII. We also really wanted to keep the communications simple, right? You wanna keep these loans flowing, you wanna minimize the support calls. So we do this with a single email alert that the email alert doesn't contain the documents of the data. It simply notifies the customer that, in this case, they may qualify for one of these loans, how to create their Interlinks account, how to authenticate the Interlinks and access that folder. And then we also are able to demonstrate that we're working hand in hand with our banks and our lending uh, partners that we're working with. Essentially, we're able to brand Interlinks according to the banks that we're working with, according to their web application branding. So uh, the small business is reassured in that they're dealing with the correct Folks, and fortunately for Interlinks and several of our small business banking customers, we already have had these small business banking solutions in place that do just this. They service loans, they upload application, they upload supporting information, ultra secure handle PII. So we simply expanded these solutions to support, you know, these, these million uh, loans that needed to be processed for COVID-19. And it's important to remember that that is the value of a SaaS application such as Interlinks is that ability to scale on demand. It's one of the values. And let's take a look at some of the other benefits of a solution like Interlinks. So we are a SaaS, Interlinks is a SaaS application that is fast to deploy. For many of our small business banking customers faced with these COVID loans, it's been deployed in under a week. We are an ultra secure SaaS application that encrypts each piece of content in transit and at rest, further protects this information with granular permissioning. And this is really important when you're handling PII, uh, you can't lose that data. If you do, you are subject to the data privacy regulations from the government and the associated bad press that comes with losing people's personal data. Uh, we were able to reduce costs by enabling a fully electronic process supported by Interlinks 24 by seven support. We were able to scale from supporting hundreds of thousands of users to millions of users with the built-in scalability 
networking, high availability, fault tolerance that is part of Intrilink's everyday business. And lastly, we enabled a defensible process by document, documenting every step of the document exchange process with granular audit trails and compliance reporting. And this provides an essential safety blanket for our banking and lending customers when you consider the intense scrutiny from the media uh, on how these COVID small business loans are getting processed and how quickly they're getting processed. So with that, let's go into some of the questions. Uh, and thank you all of the, the panelists so far for, for those contributions. Uh, we have had a few questions come in on the, uh, on the Q&A section. So without further ado, um, can you speak to the auditability in light of any potential fraud? Yeah, I, I think I can take that one in. So this is important. Um, I think given the nature of the exercise, lenders are, are laser focused on the near term ask to get these loans out uh, as quickly as possible, but they also need to be sure that they've got a, a you know, full picture of the long term implications as well. You know, lenders need to be sure they're in a position to protect themselves as these government relief programs, as I mentioned, are representing a massive opportunity for fraud. Um, so as a solution, you know, Interlinks offers reporting to provide full audit trails of all user activity, um, you know, with the appropriate context should, you know, reg uh, regulatory inquiries occur. So, you know, while the use of the data room itself does not um, prevent attempts of fraud, uh, it does aid in the provision of proof. It, you know, it serves as a central source of record. It, it keeps the record of who does what and when. This is all stored to, and, and you know, serves as a, a, a means to some, solve for some of that, um, you know, fraud risk at the end of this project. Hopefully that answers the question, but happy to take a follow-up. I think that I think that does answer the question. Thank you, Pete. Uh, we have another question as well. Uh, many banks appear to be using email to receive applications. Uh, this seems to be the quickest way to receive an application. W what is your What is your take on that? Yeah, yeah, it's inter it's something we noticed as well um, as we kind of reviewed the bank's approach. Some of the banks approach to this project. So, so we would advise against email. Um, as we discussed earlier, you know, the eagerness to progress quickly needs to be tempered by the risks associated with a given process. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, you know, email, as we know, is inherently unsafe. So unless your information is locked at the file level, every email is sent um, and has the, the potential to cause a security breach. So you know, when we take a look at this, um, you know, Instagram automatically encrypts and embeds file level security in every document um, to give you control over not only who can open a file, uh, but also, you know, what, what can be done with the file and how long it's accessible for. Um, so, you know, we certainly would advise against emails as a means to kind of get through this project, though. Happy to take a follow up. Thank you, Pete. Um, no next. Um, no, I, th I think that's, uh, that answers it. I, I see them come through disconnected, so there might be one later, uh, which I will direct okay. back towards you. <laughs> um, next question. Why can't we use our own website to collect loan applications? That's a good question, and I can take that one. So you would be opening up your organization to massive security threats as well as difficulty to meet the demand. So Intralinks has built in high availability to support spikes in demand. We employ a web application firewall that's specifically tuned to uh, look for anomaly and, uh, anomalies and suspicious activities or any content even gets to Intralinks. Um, our data centers are held to the highest standards such as ISO 27001 for security controls, policies and procedures. Um, we audit those controls with the highest auditing standard, which is the SOC 2 auditing uh, standard. And then we also uh, are audited by our customers. So we come in every other week and do pen tests uh, and security analysis on our application, our infrastructure, 
even our offices. And then we Im implement controls based on the threats of our customers. So there's a unique community effect that's really unmatched in the marketplace. And then, you know, things like fraud, we employ multi-factor authentication by default. Uh, you can uh, employ explicit two-factor authentication. So for a lender to sort of build that capability in this short time frame is just, it's not possible. So long-winded answer to a pretty, pretty good question. <laughs> That's, that was an enormous amount of security detail delivered in that, Dom. Thank you. <laughs> Thank sure. you very much. Um, so perhaps a, uh, a slightly slightly lighter question. Um, it, to be clear, is, is there any files that are currently being emailed? No, there are not any files that are being emailed. So I wasn't sure who was going to pick that one up. No, no, everything is uh, everything is done uh, encrypted in transit, or it's at rest, and nothing is being done over email. And Anna, it's Adam here. I can maybe build on that. You know, the the bank's email uh, they often use secure email, but it's not actually that secure, and the bank staff hate it. It's really clunky to use. Uh, and I think, you know, when the inevitable regulatory review comes along at the end of this, I don't think email is going to cut the mustard, frankly. So, you know, any organization putting themselves in, in that space is going to risk exposure. And, you know, I, I don't know about you, but if I was the CEO of a bank, I don't think I'd take that risk to be splashed on the front page to be, you know, losing some of that vital data at a critical time of crisis. Yeah, it just comes back to the auditability uh, issues we were discussing a moment ago. You know, it, it, using email would, would lose that, that function effectively. So, um, this question is actually from me. So, what, what are the, what are the um, implications if something does go wrong? So you, you've talked about, um, you know, email being unsecure and, and you know, auditability for fraud, et cetera. W what happens when things go wrong? I mean, I can take it from a security perspective. You know, when we talk about uh, an organization choosing their own website, right? So one thing, they may not be able to meet the demand. They may have some security breaches that will kill the whole small business process. But even worse than that, once uh, an intruder gets into their network, they can bring down other critical systems as well. So it may not just kill the small business lending effort. It may kill some of uh, the banks are the lenders, other critical processes in, in their core business. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I can maybe build on that as well, which is, I mean, we touched earlier on the, the reputational impact on some of these banks already that we're seeing, which is driving customer behavior and switchers elsewhere. People have very long memories. So, you know, if, if that were to happen, I think that would seriously undermine uh, a bank's reputation and would cause some significant brand damage. And, you know, uh, having worked with the bank for a long time, you know, they, they just want to, don't want to go there. So um, it, it's not a risk of taking, frankly. That makes sense. Well, thank you all. Uh, we are just coming up to the 25 minutes mark now. Uh, if you have any, any further comments, uh, now would be the time, time to make them. And we have closed off all the questions. So in which case, thank you very much, all of you, for, uh, for being part of this panel and talking to us today. Thank you very much to all the attendees who are, who are dialed in. I hope you uh, found this interesting. And uh, the final thing to say is I hope everybody has a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Anna.